craving, the clinging, it gets tighter and bigger. And then their habitual tendency might be to yell at you, or it might be to spank the child if he did something the wrong way in the airport on the trip. <laughs> it could be anything, you know. And then the birth of action happens. That's this one. And the last, the thing about craving and clinging that's tricky that I want to show you is both of these have a description word and that is grasping. They both feel like you're immediately craving, you're wanting it like this or you want to push it away, but this, this powerful feeling, okay. But then when the, the, you start the story, it gets like hook, grasping, grasping, and that grasping, but you can't teach this as grasping. Why can't you teach it as grasping? Because these are two distinct, different ones. And the Buddha made a big deal out of this because if you cling to nothing, are you free from suffering? No, you are not. Because this, the, the big serious one is still there. You know, this, this, one, this one is still here, this guy. And he's very serious. Nobody gets rid of the craving all the way until they're an arahat. That's the deal. Nobody walks around with absolutely never saying, I don't like this or I like this, you know? Nobody does, does that. The Sotapanna, the Sakadagami, they're not free from this. Don't, don't let anybody kid you, okay? And the Anagami still, it's there. I don't like that, you know? And you know, it's like eating anything. Okay, so. So the Winyana, we have this story. First, this is the exercise here that you can play with. You go for a walk tomorrow and you, you try to just think for a minute, can I perceive something without being conscious and feeling something? Can I do that? No. Well, can I uh, feel something painful or pleasant without being conscious and without perceiving it? Mm. No. <laughs> Can I be conscious without perceiving that I am by feeling that I'm conscious? No. See? So you have this little thing here. And when we start to have discussions about this guy or any of the three, we have to remember they're all happening together. See? This isn't trying to tell you. And down here on the lifeline, the thing to remember is you're in the little car. They built it for you. And when you grow up, the seat is still perfect. It, it's like your car seat when you're a baby, but then it turns into a perfect car and it fits you now. And you're still, you're driving through life, okay? Like a little crystal car. But the problem with this is you're moving along. Everybody is. But what we do is we make a mistake. We open up the trunk like this, okay, if this is the back of the car, and we put stuff from the past into the trunk, and we try to load down the car with everything from the past. And then we can't have new relationships. We're stuck because, like I told you, when you meet the other person in relationships, when people were asking about that this week, you have these little baskets. If you're over 20, you definitely have a shopping cart in front of you that you're pushing around. But you go and have lunch together and then you have everything and then finally you move in together. And when you move in together, you forgot where your cart was. You go back and get it and bring it in the apartment with you. And then it's the end of everything because now I get to see who you are and you get to see who I am. <laughs> because now we have our habits and our past with us and then this starts to interrupt this relationship that we had when we were just walking down the street innocently and hello. See, that's the way that story works. I can't even watch a movie anymore. You just turn it on and you know what the end is before you get to the first or second scene, <laughs> especially in almost anything you look at. All right. So I don't know if I answered this question, Bonte, but ask, ask me if I did. Saiba, <laughs> <laughs> uh, if you want to uh, uh, kind of uh, ask a follow-up question or something like that, or we go to the next question. Let us go to the next question. Okay. okay. But uh, you... so this is, okay, I, I'll just ask the question. Uh, this is from Rahul uh, Kamble. 
-huh. yes, the, he has three questions. I'll ask one after another. Uh, the first question is how to strike a balance between the following pair of seven factors of enlightenment. That Ooh. is superior energy and uh, parashaddi, uh, tranquility. That is not the word we use for tranquility. Um, no, it, what's tranquility? Okay, anyways, uh, tranquility and energy. How do you uh, strike a balance? Hasadi, Hasadi. Hasadi, huh? Hasadi. Wait. Um, we got to erase the word for a minute. Wait. <clears throat> no, I hate to do this too because I know some of you. Like, so take a picture of the board, anybody who wants it. So, okay, here we go. Is that right? I did the right one. Yeah. Okay. Um, Let's try to understand first the seven pieces and the way that we found out you could use it in your practice to, and what are you really doing with this either? That's, a, that's another one. I, you have to look at that. What, um, you know, you're going through the different uh, stages and you're, what you're doing is you're going down a path and the path has road signs and these are the little jhanas and the jhanas that you're going through. And it's a set of information. I was looking at one, one um, sutta earlier that had anarata in it. And um, in the sutta, um, in one paragraph talked about all of the jhanas. It was really funny. I just, I caught it and I'm the one sentence for each one. <laughs> And I thought, wow, he's really got it down. The, the, the different, the different um, pieces that are in each jhana, what's, what's coming up, what's going away. All right. But your whole thing that you're going through here is you are going down this path um, to, to, uh, to reach cessation and then experience Nibbana. That's what's happening. Okay. Now this is when you're practicing this uh, for the purpose of the main objective. Some people come to meditation and don't want to go to Nibbana. That's, they just want to be, uh, you know, feel better in life and be cool after work and rest and all that stuff. That's perfectly fine. But if you get hooked on this, the way I did, <laughs> oh boy. <laughs> so you just, you really love this because every day there's something new you learn. and you think you're in a retreat, treat and I'm trying to help you with a retreat, but when you come to a retreat, you're, I'm all of a sudden in training again, and I find out new things from every time I work with a group of people. Now, this, this line, I'm going to do it, I like to do it the way this one monk designed it. I'll show you what he did. He called this one is mindfulness, okay? And then, you know, he, he kept the idea of this is a teeter-totter. Well, I did it backwards, didn't I? No, my, it's my head. Wait a second. Let's see if I can do it again. Okay, one more time. It's a teeter-totter. And the way he talks about it is he likes to put it um, with this piece. Here, and this is mindfulness because it's an observation tool. Now, in a lot of times when people define mindfulness, um, they they don't talk about it the same way we do. But we realize that the mindfulness was to pay attention to what you're watching because we began to discover what the Buddha was actually doing. And we began to understand you have to be watching to learn it. And we had all these clues that were showing up, you know, and the clues, um, the clues were, um, this is not something that um, you're actually trying, well, I don't know how to say that. You are actually trying to um, discover something and you're trying to discover how everything works. Okay. Uh, 
हेलो या या इट्स माय क्वेश्चन एक्चुअली आई वुड लाइक टू ऐड समथिंग मोर टू इट व्हेन वी आर लाइक लाइक इन टर्म्स ऑफ एनर्जी एंड ट्रंकिलिटी माय क्वेश्चन इज दैट आई अंडरस्टैंड वी हैव टू टेक एफर्ट्स ऑल द टाइम to develop wholesome qualities and let go of unwholesome qualities but with the experience of meditation we experience tranquility but uh, what i experience is that experience of tranquility is so nice that it doesn't let me do something more out of it like i feel content with it and i don't feel like doing anything i feel relaxed with that and i don't feel like doing anything more so i don't know how to strike a balance between taking right effort at the same time being uh, okay so relaxed. stop a minute so what are you doing with that tranquility tell me what you just did you just said i really like this i'm going to stay here ooh yummy 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 you know and then they in, they invented uh esoteric buddhism for people who just like that and then that group of people who started that group of a buddhism they decided that is nibbana they liked it so much <laughs> and so this tranquility if you just sit in that and just decide that's what i want to do and see there's a lot of i want in this you know and this is not a very good drawing i'm going to do this again uh but so what you actually did was what i did on the other picture you know i um uh i was showing you how the craving works and what you're doing is i'm going to sit down in meditation and i close my eyes and you're maybe doing your met i don't know what what's your object in meditation what is it uh, your uh, your object of meditation yeah, yeah. my object is uh, has been forgiveness for and also the metta uh, the loving kindness well first of all you can't mix the two practices no 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 i don't mix okay. two Are you uh, doing my, are you doing the forgiveness program right now all the way through is that what you're working on Uh no no in India 3 months ago in in month of May I did my retreat 10 day retreat a uh, 7 day retreat Yeah and okay I was asked to uh I was asked to continue forgiveness for a little while and after a point I let it go and I again uh, reverted back to loving kindness so uh since then i have been doing loving kindness okay so been... i don't know i'm not sure how how in goenka jeez i don't know how in there they do forgiveness but with us it's a program and we forgive ourselves until someone pops up then somebody comes up and we start forgiving them and then they forgive us and then we keep saying a, a line a, a, it's an affirmation of i forgive myself for not understanding or i forgive myself for causing pain and suffering to myself and others and it's a dana practice so when i say you know dana right okay so as in dana okay um the um the uh idea of generosity it's generosity to yourself to forgive yourself and when somebody else pops up it's generosity to forgive them and when they get to the point and they do if you do this right where they forgive you it's generosity to them to help them be able to forgive you by accepting it you understand so it's a really super duper uh generosity practice of forgiveness and it works a special way people are telling me they go crazy with it it's so beautiful because if you do this properly when you're forgiving this this other person all of a sudden they forgive you and it's like a whole big thing just fell off of you and you just get so full of joy and contentment and 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 you have such tranquility and it lasts for a long time but then you keep going with the program because then if you open the door and one person you have to convince your mind it's okay to forgive because most people haven't been forgiving anything during their lifetime in a lot of countries and so you have to convince your brain it's okay to forgive but once you open that gate and somebody comes through like that and goes all the way through one guy had 11 or 12 after that that came out one by one and worked on him individually until he forgave everybody and he was so free and so light 
unbelievable in life and in meditation. All of what we're doing here is all about what you can use in life, see? Now I'm gonna explain this the way we teach you. Listen carefully, okay? You'll be familiar with part of this, but some of the terminology is gonna be different, okay? Because we don't, use, we don't do this quite the same way, okay? So mindfulness for us is observation power, okay? And mindfulness has a quality, couple qualities. It helps me remember to keep my meditation going when my mindfulness is sharp. It helps me to remember if anything blocks me or gives a barrier to my practice, a hindrance. It helps me remember how to escape because the Buddha actually did find an escape and an antidote. And it wasn't just the super mundane Nibbana. It was all the parts of the escape you can use in daily life until you finally get to that super mundane Nibbana. You see, it's a little different. So when we're talking about the seven factors of enlightenment, I'm going to bring you back here because I want to stick with this question. You look at the pieces that are involved and the pieces are first investigation. The second one is energy. The third one is joy. The fourth one is tranquility. Okay, the, the next one is your concentration. And we call this collectedness of mind. We don't like to say concentration because I don't ever want to see you go like this on the breath or on meta or on anything. I want your internal mind open so you can see what the Buddha saw and learn it the same way he did, the way it's talked about in the text. I want your experience, my, uh, my job is just to point and keep you on track so that you can experience this the way he did and he wants you to do it according to the text through direct knowledge. And direct knowledge doesn't mean just, I'm gonna go meditate together with people. It means inside, you have to see how it works yourself in order to believe it. So knowledge and vision comes before knowledge and wisdom. We don't work just for knowledge and wisdom. We first work for knowledge and vision to perfect it. That means we will never do anything in our practice. Eventually, we will never do anything in our practice that uh, our mind won't do it unless it helps us to see how everything's working. The last one of this, this, uh, this means to you concentration would mean productive concentration. So what did the Buddha mean by productive concentration? He, the, te, the commentary calls it that, and what it meant was to the Buddha, he defines the, the productive concentration as meaning a concentration level that's not too tight, not too loose, that allows me to move down the noble path. And his had only one thing he had to say about meditation, good and bad. You know, good meditation, he told Ananda, is the one, is a, any meditation form, but as long as it allows you to move down smoothly down the path and, and, and discover what he discovered, it's good. If it doesn't move down the path easily for you, you need to retune, refine, figure out what's not quite in alignment in the instructions somewhere and didn't match what he said. Otherwise, it would be easy to understand. It would be immediately effective in your life. It would be inviting deeper inspection for you to see how everything really works, every piece of it. Like your question's good because you're asking about this and you're asking about this, okay? Look at this, this now. Um, it, it, the other piece was with, the, with the, the, the meditation, if it's operating correctly the way he was doing it, it's never going to change. He said to, the, to Ananda, it's going to be, it's untouched by time. That means for generations, as long as you're repeating his instructions and you're understanding them correctly, that's the catch precisely. And you do the ingredients of this cake mix this way and blend it the way I'm telling you, you're going to get the same cake. That's what he kind of said. I'm a cook, you know. <laughs> okay, so this one, you know, your tranquility, your concentration. Last one is equanimity. Now, 
these are interesting because a lot of times we hear people talk about these as if we're not going to talk about them till we're way into the fourth jhana and we're not going to talk about them how they operate but then what we figured out when we were practicing they are actually operating and they're important from before the first jhana even starts and you have degrees of understanding and degrees of how they actually hook together because what we want to see these do, we don't want to study them one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. We want to study them as uh, seven, seven pieces, but once we meet and greet them, we know who they are. As soon as we do that, we want to see them do this and come together and be the seven factors with the power of the seven factors. Now, why are the seven factors so important? If you're actually working on the path, they're very important. Because we hear in the uh, Samyutta Nikaya, and Bhikkhu Bodhis, you go to page 1596, and you start reading the discussion section on, uh, about the seven factors of enlightenment in um, terms of the, uh, uh, what is it? <laughs> in terms of the uh, nutriment, is it nutriment or is it, denutriment, not feeding it or not feeding the hindrances. You know, it's all about the hindrances. The Bojanga section, I thought it was going to be all about the enlightenment factors. <laughs> but when I got there, it was all about the hindrances. And it tells us a big secret about our barriers, the trouble you have in your meditation, the, the, the uh, hindrances of uneven, too much or too little energy, too much or too little tranquility, all of that. It's it's all right there. And what it's basically saying is when you pay attention to a hindrance, no matter what it is, um, it will allow not allow the it will not allow the seven factors to come up and to become balanced like they are right here. And this is sort of a picture of it's sort of level. But what happens to you in your training, this is a seesaw that goes like this, doesn't it? It goes like this. And if you have too much energy, what happens? You have restlessness, don't you? You have restlessness that occurs. You can't sit long, you gotta get up, you gotta walk, you gotta move. In your life, it's the same thing. If you have too much tranquility, then you start getting sloth and torpor, right? And your sloth and torpor comes up, so if you have sloth and torpor, so, but even though we talk about this is what's happening here, how do we solve these hindrances from blocking our meditation? That is the big question. And I can tell you, and I can teach you the laws of meditation that we figured out. I can show you all kinds of things and tomorrow you'll forget it and you'll do just what you're doing now. <laughs> it's funny. Everybody does this, you know, we all go through this. So when I teach you, I have to teach you the exact same way. If you feed a hindrance, it will get bigger and stronger. It will come up and stay there longer. That's the truth. Now here's my nursery rhyme. You ready? Leave them alone and they'll go home and they'll leave their disturbances behind them. Because why would I make a nursery rhyme like that? Leave them alone and they'll go home and they'll leave their disturbances behind them. They'll just go away. They'll fade away. They'll not come back up anymore. So how, look at how do you pay attention to something in your practice? I do, right? I pay attention to it. I, st I do what? I'm meditating. Look, I'm meditating here on a chair, whatever you're doing. You are meditating at an object here, whatever it is. I don't care what kind of meditation it is, okay? And then your brain is still working while you're looking there. So you have mindfulness. Mindfulness is your observation. It has a couple of assistants. One assistant is called um, curiosity. And... Another assistant is called um, persevere. Well, 
you persevere. What is it now? Persistence. I'm sorry, persistence. So the two that we like to add to these seven, we like to add two little factors that have to do with each one of these. It affects each one of the pieces of the seven, okay? And that is this curiosity, curiosity, and there was a third one, interest. Interest is um, part of curiosity, but I put that in, and persistence. Okay, so these guys are like, these are the players here that are in the team, the, the seven factors. And these three are the guys that sit on the bench. And as the coach, you can send them in when they're needed. <laughs> you understand? Okay, that's how I set it up when I teach it to kids, okay? So this one is your investigation. And what you're investigating when you're practicing meditation is you want to learn you want to understand how all phenomena operate, how they arise, exist, and pass away. You want to understand that. So as you're watching inside, we watch inside. We don't just close our eyes and nothing's in there. We teach you about the vision inside and all the things the Buddha talked about in the texts that he was observing. And when you're watching inside, there is actually... Um, one guy said, there's nothing in there. I said, look, let's pretend for a while there's a movie screen and there's no movie on it. And you go in there and you just sit in the theater and watch the black screen. Close your eyes, but don't expect anything. You just, if they want to throw you out of the theater, you say, no, no, sister came and told me to come here. She didn't tell me what the movie was. She told me to sit here and watch the black screen. Okay, they'll let you stay. Okay, so they, they watch the screen. And what you see is start to see how things are moving, how things are working between the brain and how the phenomena comes up that you move your attention. Now here's, this is an interesting question we're gonna to touch right now for anybody that's watching. I see a lot of reports in the retreat telling me I sat with my object of meditation until mind, wandered away that's what they tell me and then they say then i had to do something i had to go investigate or see what okay what's wrong with this sentence does your mind actually wander think about this for a minute or do i lose my mindfulness on the investigation I'm examining, investigation, or I'm examining energy or joy, when I'm examining it, do I lose my interest and persistence in watching how this works? And when something does come up, which by the way, is a Nietzsche says, it's always gonna come up and be there and just go away. So why would I do anything to it? There's no reason for me to do anything to it. But if I do something with it, then these, these pieces that you want to know about, these pieces are never going to come into balance. You keep them from coming into balance because of the hindrances. And it's not because of the hindrances, it's because of you. It's because I am responsible, but they don't want to say that. So they write the report and they say, you know, it was okay until my mind wandered away to the hindrance. Now, what actually happened? I'm going to tell you, because if you're in my retreat right now, I want you to understand this. This is really, really an important piece. Mind does not wander. Mind's attention moves. That's true. But mind's attention moves. When the brain pops up something, mind's attention is moving. But I decide to crave and cling or not to crave and cling, that is the Buddhist question. To be or not to be with Shakespeare. To crave and cling or not to crave and cling, that's the Buddhist. You see? <laughs> so you are ultimately responsible. I know they told you this with, with where you're studying. I know somebody said this one time, you are responsible for your suffering. Nobody else makes you suffer. You crave and cling or you don't crave and cling. 
you are completely in control of what happens with how you decide to see the world. And that is called perception, per perspective, I'm sorry, perspective, not perception, perspective. We call that the old way we say, we say right view, but we say, we say harmonious, harmonious perspective. Perspective is your view, your perspective, her perspective, their perspective. Boy, that sounds like politics again. <laughs> His perspective, her perspective, okay. You choose every single day of your life. How am I going to look at the world today? And when somebody yells at you, you decide if they yelled at me or if they're in pain and suffering and they're upset with the world and they could use a little compassion and you can smile gently and not take it personally. You have a choice. But what do we do? We do too much of, if they yell at me, I have to yell back at them. I heard this from somebody who had an incident in front of their house in a neighborhood that was a tough neighborhood here in India. And he was very upset with where he was living and what had happened and everything else. And this was a crazy situation for me to listen to. A boy had, was playing street ball and a ball came in their yard. And he came through the gate because he didn't think anyone was home to get the ball and they got upset and that he did that. And then he got upset that they got upset because he just wanted his ball. And then he went outside, but the owner followed him outside and started to fight with him about being on the street at all and wearing masks and the whole thing. But the neighborhood was empty and such, but still they should have been wearing masks. It's true. But they, as soon as the boy, said something nasty and the street gang, they're gonna say something nasty. And the father took it personally, the son was standing there and the boy reached out to hit the father and then the son wanted to hit the boy. And then I said, what, what happened with laughing about this whole thing and saying, well, would you like a glass of water before you go back and maybe play outside someplace else? There's an empty lot down there, you can play down there if they didn't want him near the house. And he said, well, we can't do that. And I said, well, why can't you do that? The whole world right now, our whole world is sitting there holding its breath just to see if we're just all gonna start fighting again. Isn't that amazing? When all we have to do is decide no more, no more. You want a better world and you want it to be a particular way? That world is here right now, but you don't see it. The world you want it to be right now is right here, right now, but you don't make it happen. And you say, well, how can I? Well, the point is people have to figure out what they really want and think about and dream and have drive for and entrepreneurs trying to succeed and everything else is actually there right now for them. They just have to see it and make it happen now. But here you go, You're, these three over here, these have energy in them. These three over here, they have low energy, high energy and low energy. The balancing point is, the, the center part of this is watching them. Now what we teach, is from the time we teach you about these pieces, these different pieces, okay? They're in the first jhana, they're in the second jhana, they're in the third, but they're, you're having to check them every once in a while. You know the five faculties and the five powers, energy is one of the pieces, tranquility is one of the pieces, equanimity you hear about all the time, mindfulness you hear about all the time. Because they're happening at different levels of the different parts of the development as you go through your practice. When you get into the deeper states, like into infinite space, infinite consciousness, then it's between them happening uh, closer to very quickly for you, balancing themselves, okay? And you don't have to think about it so much anymore. But then when you get into nothingness, 
they start to balance themselves. And it's just like, it's, a, it's like this, it's like balancing a, a, a balance bar and trying to walk across a tightrope to the other side of a, a deep crevice. Just think about Indiana Jones in The Last Crusade when he couldn't walk across to the room until he found out how to go across, how to find the path across. And the path across is when this is level, it's all level together. But this can never function for you if you still have the hindrances and you have not solved their problem. Because this is what, I really wanted to see this in the Semyuta Nikaya because I can show you where these will start to develop very well and come out evenly if you would just listen to what the Buddha said about handling the hindrances. You don't fight with them. You don't have to destroy them, annihilate them, eradicate them, stop them, suppress them, or subdue them. All you have to do is relinquish them, abandon them, release them, allow them, just let them be. And then they will become destroyed, annihilated, and eradicated. Somewhere there was a translation mix-up, which wasn't a translation, but an understanding. There was a flip. We have to fight with these. You do not have to fight with them. If you don't understand, you need to read the art of war and see why Sun Tzu was so famous for writing the book, The Art of War. He was teaching the army how to succeed to win the territory without damaging the people or the territory or even his own men. He was trying to teach the, the kings at that time how to do that, the emperors and stuff. And that's why that book was so incredibly famous. It has a lot to do with knowing the territory, knowing your strengths, knowing your weaknesses, understanding the biggest one is where the supply line is for the other army. If you know where the supply line is for the other army and you cut off the supply line, there's no more war. It stops everything. You understand? You get what I mean? Okay. But if you intend to fight against the other army, you could wipe out villages and destroy people and kill the cropland. And today you're talking nuclear types of things. You would, you would be just ruining whatever you played with. The boys and their toys are out of their mind right now, see? Because if they play with any of the toys that they have, they set up a situation where nothing of value is there anymore. So in this case, in your practice, if you fool around with this the wrong way, you want to know how I can have more tranquility. That's not the game. The game was, what was this for? What was this for? Okay, and here's what it was for. Over here, like we'll pretend you're in the, well, let's do it down here. Let's make a little more room, make more sense here. We'll just make a little bit more room. Anyway, your mind does not move, guys. I got to tell you, your mind does not wander. <laughs> you decide to give up your mindfulness, lose your curiosity, give up your interest, and then you decide to move over to a hindrance. That's what happens. That's actually functionally, we can wire you up. We can see how you do it. We can see how it happens. It's not the mind, it's, it's me personally. So the big thing was to, the way to get into the cessation, into the last part, how do you get through that door? Cessation has a door, um, an imaginary door, if you will. Let's pretend that cessation has a door that is shaped like this. And the lock is not a normal lock. The lock in this door for you to go through to fall into cessation and then come out of it and experience Nibbana, this lock, <laughs> it's shaped like this. And the reason you couldn't find it is because you were for the wrong shape. You have to put something in there, you see, and then turn it. And the door just opens and you fall through. And what is that that you put in that lock to open the door to fall through to go into cessation? It's this. This is what it is. It's this. Perfectly balanced. And in 
by the time you get to nothingness and neither perception or non-perception, you can't even go there unless this is perfectly balanced. If it tips, you fall out. If it comes back in, you come back in and experience it again, you can fall out. Nothingness, those two levels are really like that, you know, that you have to really get perfectly. And the thing is, but you don't control it. You don't make it get perfectly balanced. Isn't that funny? You just prepare the soil for that to happen. You know what boomy is? Boomy means the perfectly prepared soil so the plant can grow, in this case, so the knowledge can grow and the, the, the wisdom can grow, is the boomy. And the boomy is understanding how all this stuff fits together so that it can grow easily, the plant. In this case, we're talking about the balancing of these seven factors of enlightenment. And also, I was trying to figure out, do they have a, um, let's look at this, do they have a causal relationship? This is another interesting part about these guys. As you're doing investigation, you're learning, you're learning to watch very closely. And in order to watch very closely, you have to have the right amount of energy. So these are cooperative. And then this has to come so that the, in, the investigation is easy to do and it's very clear. You have the right amount of energy and not too much, but not too little. Then in the, the uplifted joy happens in the first jhana. And that's how it happens. The deeper joy, the mudita later on happens. This is the mudita factor. How it works is when these are in balance. When you tilt it, if there's too much energy, what do you do in your practice? You say, I will sit with tranquility. You can say metta with tranquility and then see what happens. Tell your mind, just say metta with tranquility and sit and see what happens. If it's too much tranquility and you start to have sloth and torpor, what should you do? Okay, you say more energy, more energy. You're in charge inside. It's, it's um, wisdom's eye functioning inside. Who's there was the big question, even in the time of the Buddha. If with the misunderstanding, misunderstanding about Atta and Anatta, okay, when we just say self and no self, everybody gets really upset. You're a nice guy. You're a handsome guy. You're a self. You're a personality. You don't want to give that up. I want my Atta. <laughs> you see? But... What, what if I could explain it to you a different way that you wouldn't get so upset? If, if your atta is me, it's the self thing. And, and the problem is when I say it is, the whole experience is me, it is mine, it is myself. That's a very heavy thing to, turn, to carry around, isn't it? A very heavy thing to carry around in life. But if you come to understand what would it be like if I, if I lived a few days and I didn't take anything personally? Because Atta makes you take everything personally. Somebody yells at you, I bet you go like that, and then you want to yell back. You're right there, ready to say something else back to them. See? That's the Atta in both people. Now, when the person is practicing Anatta, the no Atta, there's no Atta practicing it, this is not me. This is not mine. This is not myself. This is this guy. His dog died on the weekend. He's really miserable. He came to work and he's yelling at me. I think what he needs is a cup of tea. So you kind of start sending him loving kindness out of your heart. And as soon as he shuts up, you take him and get him some tea or ice cream or whatever you want. And then you talk to him and listen to what happened to him. And you're going to find out this person yelling at you, this boss, this delivery person, the supervisor, whatever it was, there's something wrong going on. And if you can listen long enough or watch closely long enough, you'll find out you can ease the person's pain by giving them some space to talk or giving them something, you know, tea, coffee, crackers, cookies, <laughs> whatever, you know, it's a little bit of time to, to find out what really happened and everything will even out between the two of you. You don't have to give them advice, just watch, just listen, smile, be supportive, that sort of thing. Anyway, this anatta is not you disappearing. It is you deciding to live a life that you have dreamed of, a world that is unselfish, a world that is kind, a world that is full of compassion, 
is one that starts out by saying, let's not be selfish, let's not be cruel, let's not be that way about me and mine and myself and my stuff. Let's be without that. This is not me. It is, this is not mine. It's not myself. That's where the Buddha was taking you. If we go back to the process of everything we're talking about, we go back to the Dwe Devi Chaka Sutta, Najima Nikaya number 19, and we listen. We listen to the first lines of the thing. And he's telling you what he's, what he's doing from the point where he is a bodhisattva, and then when he becomes enlightened, he's going to talk to you more about this the same way. And he says, monks, before my enlightenment, when I was only an unenlightened bodhisattva, it occurred to me, what's probably occurred to you, <laughs> suppose that I divide my thoughts in two classes. And on one side, I set my thoughts of sensual desire, thoughts of ill will, and thoughts of cruelty. And on the other side, I set up thoughts of renunciation. And you do the opposite of ill will is loving kindness, right? And then non-cruelty, non-ill will, that, that one, the non-ill will or non-cruelty is the compassion and thoughts of uh, non-cruelty. So it's saying compassion, uh, renunciation, letting go of the other stuff and just living with loving kindness and compassion. See? So when everybody wants you to do something, but you don't want to do it, but you decide, well, I'll do it because they want me to do it. I'm in lockdown and they're miserable and I'm miserable. I'll do it. But we have all these people upset with their parents and fighting with their siblings and everything. You see, it's silly. They've never been so much having to be together so long as the problem, see? But then he abided, he abided there and he just, as experiments here, I'm not going to read it to you, but he experiments like a high school science project. What happens if I live with loving kindness and forgiveness and compassion for a week? And I forgive absolutely everything happening around me. And I act with loving kindness when I speak or I think or I act. And compassion means I help them where it's needed or give them the space to be able to figure out their own pain and suffering, and I support them. What would happen if you were living like that for a week? And then over here, well, what would happen if everything is me, it's mine and myself, and don't touch my books and don't touch this and don't do that, and I want my space and I want it now, and you, no, I don't care, I don't wanna do it your way, I'm gonna do it my way, but my way is better. <laughs> and there you are. And he decides, you know, that isn't working. Uh, and then he comes over to the other side. I think this is what I need to do, this. And after he's awake, he says to us, we have to keep the five precepts. We have to. They're a guideline structure. If you keep the precepts, the hindrances won't come up, he explains again and again and again. Okay. And then he tells us in 22, he says, listen to this, if you, you think I'm silly about the hindrances, and I know it's kind of the opposite from some training, you're not supposed to spend any time with them at all. Um, this story of the Alagadupa Masutta, Majima Nikai number 22, is very special to me because in it, I found the order from the general. If I was talking about the two armies or something, you know, and the other army was the hindrances about to invade. But the general on our side, he knew how we could beat them by stopping the supply line instead. And just they wouldn't have enough food. They'd have to go back to their country and they wouldn't be a war. He knew that. So, but his men, they wanted to attack the other army. And so, this is the same story here, a different way. This monk, he wants to um, engage the hindrances when they come up. To engage a hindrance, it means here, over here, you leave your object of meditation when this guy comes up. And you want to know what that is. And so you, get, you go over there with your attention instead. You see? You go over there. And when you go over there, 
you're leaving your object of meditation alone. I don't care what it is, breath, whether it's breath or loving kindness or whatever you're doing. And the Buddha said, don't do that. When you leave that, then you fail at your meditation. I've never taught that way. So what he says to him when he comes back, he says, misguided man, to whom have you ever known me to teach the Dhamma in that way? Misguided man, have I not stated many, many ways how obstructive things become obstructions and how they are able to obstruct one who engages in them. So basically he's giving the command, do not engage the hindrance. Abandon it, relinquish it, leave it alone. Do not engage it. The moment you engage it, what will happen to your precious seven pieces here? They will never come up in alignment for you to be able to use them in on the path or to be able to get in cessation and experience Nibbana. It's impossible. So in the Samyutta Nikaya is telling us the title of that discussion. And the title is about, I will teach you the nutriment. This is what I teach in another class and teach you the nutriment and the denourishment in regards to the five hindrances and the seven factors of enlightenment. That's what he's teaching in this one discussion. It starts on page 1597, goes for about four, four or five pages because he has to repeat it in, for each one of the seven times, you know, seven times what happens with, when you pay attention to the hindrance and seven times when you let go of the hindrance, how these can come into alignment. So the question is, do I make these come into alignment? No, you don't do anything. So the question is, what do I have to do to succeed at my meditation? And the basic thing is, don't do anything. Don't do anything. Can you imagine saying that to most men is very difficult. <laughs> very difficult to hear. They want to be the first one. They have to be in control. They don't believe the ship can cross the ocean if we don't have our hands on it, steering every single second because I'm the one that's going to do it. I have to say I did it. All of that belongs to who? It belongs to cousin Atta. She's got a hold of you. Atta has a hold of you. Cousin Atta or Auntie Atta makes you think you have to control the meditation in order to make it happen. But what the truth of it was, if you let go and relax and smile and come back and keep watching this, this guy is always going to come up when you sit in meditation, there is absolutely nowhere in the entire Tepitika, we checked with some people that have the whole thing in their head, and there's no place, no, no place does it ever say that you are supposed to stop your brain from producing thoughts like this all around you why, while you're sitting in meditation. Also, you might notice in Thailand or Burma or different countries, sometimes the forest meditators, they'll sit in the middle of the street in a, in a village where the traffic is, or else they will um, sit where a waterfall is really, really loud, or they'll go where there's birds or bees that are building in the spring. Why are they doing that? They're just allowing everything to be natural, and they're just going to sit there, and they're going to keep... Uh, practicing no matter what happens and let go of the hindrances. Okay. So this is how you bring this whole thing into your uh, balance is by letting them go and stop feeding them and then they disappear. Okay. So, we get far. so do we have any other questions that you have? Yeah, my questions have been listed in that email. I have two more questions. Another person. Hello. Yeah. 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 Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. Uh, so, uh, see, there are three questions given by him, but uh, yeah. I will uh, go to another person and come back uh, to uh, questions of Rahul uh, later. 
there is okay. a question by uh, Stephen Tan. Mm -hmm. uh, the question is when I do six directions, the feeling change to space expansion, and after that, calm. Radiate in six directions, but some sometimes it is stuck. It just stays and can't change direction. Am I supposed to just ob observe the feeling of calmness? At time, the feeling of metta just disappear all okay. all together. Okay. That's, that's a big question, <laughs> um, but I think I got it. Okay, so let me try to get out of here. Whoops. Yeah, there we go. Now. There's a lot of discussion that happens when we're in retreat with beginners. This always comes up, okay? And, and that is, how much do I really have to have the power of metta to do this meditation? How much does my feeling have to be? How much, how much, how much? <laughs> Part of this is, you know, I have to make it big and strong in order to be successful because our whole world revolves around this. You know, well, that's not the case, all right? Um, if you go back, I can't get people to really read these instructions very carefully. And I have tried to tell people when I send you the, the written part of the instruction that you need to read it and read it and read it, but read it with a highlighter and highlight it as you go through it. The instructions are very specific. If you, he memorized them and in the early films that we did back in, uh, you know, 2003, four, five, six, seven, back then, uh, you know, he was, do, he was reciting it. Bonte was just reciting it verbatim. I never could really memorize that very well, but he was brilliant with this. So when you, when you practice loving kindness, you first remember a time when you were happy. Do you remember that line? That's at the very beginning of the instructions. It's a warm, glowing feeling in the center of your chest. And it's a happy feel, a, a, a secure feeling. And you take that feeling and you put it into your heart. And the first thing you do when you practice is you send loving kindness to yourself. And I tell people ever since I've been in India, it's like a waterfall. <laughs> Go and sit under the waterfall and enjoy the loving kindness coming over yourself and like filling up inside you first. The very first step, even in the Visuddhi Magga, it sits there because somebody wrote a book recently and, they, and the first thing they said was the Karaniya Metta Sutta does not say to send any loving kindness to yourself. Stop that. And I'm there, whoa, my gosh. <laughs> whoa, my gosh, what are you doing? And then I kept reading, I kept reading. And when it got to this, the, the translation, translating the Karaniya Metta Sutta, the funny part was, it says that you send this Metta to everybody who's female and male and fat and skinny and and wide and tall and this and that and I said well, wait a second I'm I'm fat and I'm a female and <laughs> I'm sitting here that must mean I send it to me too and then there's a problem when you say don't ever do that to yourself because in the world right now if we took thousand people right now a large percentage of them standing right in front of you they hate themselves this is the problem right now they hate the world and the way it is, and they hate themselves. This is an issue. So not only do we have a problem of forgiving ourselves, but forgiving the world and the world leaders and the embezzlers and the thieves and the military and the boys toys and the rest of it, forgiving the whole thing and getting free of it so we can work in a present time. But first we have to love ourselves because the fact remains and nobody can change this. Do you see this safety pin? You see it? See it? Can you see the safety pin? Can I give you the safety pin if I don't have it in my hand? I can't give it to you. Why in the world do you think you can give loving kindness sincerely to anybody if you don't have it for yourself? The Buddha told you a person who loves themselves and respects themselves will never hurt another human being. It's one of the things the monks are supposed to learn, remember, reflect on, and repeat. Sister Anybody Kumar, who I think, doesn't I love think, themselves. Uh, I think uh, we should read the question once again. I think he's 
going into a quiet mind. Uh, so just uh, I'll read the question once again. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So uh, uh, at uh, radiate in six. Uh, when I do six direction, the feeling change to space expansion. After that, calm. Radiate in six direction, but sometimes it is stuck. It just stays and can't change direction. Am I supposed to just observe the feeling of? You're going too now, fast. Too feeling, fast. Too fast. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> the main part is coming now. Okay. At the time, the feeling of metta just disappear altogether and jump to tranquility. Can't even radiate to directions. Also, I am not experiencing joy, but rather only calmness and space expansion. So what okay, does that mean? Okay, stop. Okay, stop. So joy to okay, I got it. I got it. I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> okay. When <laughs> when you felt like you just were feeling the expansion, what the world is saying to you? Hello, this is. You just arrived. So infinite space can be, we can, the marker for the infinite space is funny. The marker for the infinite, base of infinite space, um, if people say this, my head feels like it's in a balloon. All of a sudden I feel like my head is getting bigger. That's good enough for me to know that you're at the base. Other people will say freaky things like me. I stopped at a stoplight and when I rubbed my eyes, I opened them up and the whole world went like that away from me. I had to stop the car and park for a couple of minutes and figure out what was going on. I had to call Bonte on the phone, but the whole world was receding. And then after practicing a few days like that, the whole world came back into a tiny marble sized thing. So what am I experiencing is between infinite space is the expansion and the contraction is ending up for some people skip it but it's not you really should see if you can experience it because it's really an interesting level there's so much good stuff there to learn but when it contracts to really really small if you're very quiet and you always understand no matter what is happening to you if you're new in meditation Anicca is your friend. I know Anicca causes problems and suffering, but Anicca also is your friend. Why is Anicca your friend? Well, Anicca, if you remember that one guy, Anicca or girl, tells you it's always going to pass away. So no matter what happens, you know when you're sitting on a pillow or under a tree or in a, under a waterfall, wherever you're, whatever you're doing, whatever's going on is arising, it's there and passing away. I kept the Nietzsche very close to me. I was, I was down at the bottom of a mountain clearing out an area for, for growing uh, some melons next to a tiny stream at the foot of two, a crevice between two hills in a mountain range. And I was kneeling and working with the baby trees and I looked up and there was a cougar coming upstream, a female cougar, bigger, very big. Okay, let's say that. And she was just drinking and I just remembered Anicca very quickly and decided to just very quietly smile and just look at her and she looked right back at me for close to maybe a minute or two and then she went up the hill. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Anicca. <laughs> you know, Anicca is a wonderful thing. Somebody who was angry at you is just a priceless thing, okay? You always remember Anicca. The infinite space experience that the person had was one of the sudden ones where all of a sudden everything's going out. And I like to see some other people having that because sometimes I think I'm crazy. I don't hear many people tell me about that because usually it's much smaller and much different, okay? After that happens, you can learn how to go back there and sit in infinite space. It's a beautiful place to sit for hours and hours. The Buddha spent his mornings practicing compassion while sitting in infinite space. And the reason he did that was so he could see as far as he could with his, his um, eye, his divine eye and divine ear to find the people who were about to turn into arahats. That's how he found Pukarasati. That's how he knew where he was. That's this kind of thing. Okay. Um, okay, so that's that part. The second part, what was the second part, Bonte? You said um, it disappears. Okay, what happened was his meta feeling disappeared. Now, what's happening is you, you, this is the process. You practice meta from your heart. 
And most people agree on that part. But most people are, are a lot of times, they're talking a lot. We don't talk a lot. We, we give just one, may you be happy, may you be peaceful. And then we shut up, let our mind get it. And we just sit with it. You see, when we do that, you start out, you can have a nice big feeling. Okay, that's great. But then your feeling is going to leave your heart. This is going to be the natural path of the body it is going to follow if you allow this to metamorphosize from loving kindness into karuna. You understand? Okay. So if you leave it alone, it's going to want to go up the torso, across the sternum, and land in the head. And when it gets up into the head, you really can experience this expansion thing. And when it stops and the metta is gone, you have to pause and just watch very carefully. And you will see that there is still a feeling, but now it's just like a little soft thing, very, very soft and quiet. And then when you're talking about joy, you'd also talked about joy and uh, at some point having joy. And when the joy fades away, I fall into this tranquility. Well, that's the path. Whenever joy fades away, tranquility arises because joy is the uh, co-arising component or causal relationship. When it fades, karuna arises. When the compassion is very, very soft and it arose, okay then when it fades away you have this strange experience of being so excited when somebody else got the job <laughs> you know it's crazy even if you were trying to get the job you're overwhelmed with happiness for the person that just got the job this is empathetic joy you're experiencing this appreciative joy and it's just joy is the same but it's this element that you can bump into i bumped into it some people just say, no, it's just joy. But it's just inside you instead of the uplifted joy that you like and makes you feel really light, you know, and happy. This is different. This is inside, okay? And the experience of mudita, when it's time for mudita to pass away, equanimity comes up that is very strong. Now, equanimity is another lecture. It's a different story, too. It's one-footed, two-footed, three-footed animals. And finally, a four-footed animal, in, in when it gets into uh, infinite, in, into the fourth jhana, be, just before that infinite space, you had that experience of infinite space with that thing where it expanded because you were quiet enough and still enough and you had enough equanimity. It was tasting the first taste of the horse putting his all four feet on the ground and saying, I'm very firm now. I have four-footed equanimity. That means you're prepared to have the mental state experience. And what was the first mental state? Infinite space. And the second one, infinite consciousness, the third one, base of nothingness, okay? That's how that works. That's your path, okay? So all of this is logical and it all is happening exactly as it should. The reason anybody's frustrated is because it wasn't mentioned or you didn't see a chart of it, so you didn't expect it, you see? And then it gets confusing. So with metta, you're not now, once the metta changes into the karuna, you're sending karuna to the directions. So don't be trying to, and anyway, that's a trap because when you're working with the directions, which is what you mentioned, <laughs> the um, directions, we don't want to send, we don't want to push, we don't want to deliver. <laughs> uh, we don't want to even say radiate because you might think you have to do something to radiate. We keep hunting for that magic word where everybody would understand you have become a candle. And just like the little kid with I'm a little teapot, short and stout, and here is my body and here is my spout. Well, you're a little kid and you just became a candle and you're supposed to sit on the saucer in the dark room. You can do it tonight. Turn the lights out, have a candle, put it on the saucer and light the candle. And then you tell me how hard did the candle work to push the light into the room? That's how hard you're allowed to send 
loving kindness or karuna or anything to someone else. It's an intention of, it's an intention of aiming the energy produced in your brain as uh, loving kindness of the metta and aiming it that way, that way, or that way. You can see somebody fall off a bike and you're in a taxi, tell the taxi driver to stop, stay on the other side of the road, send metta toward the screaming people. Watch what happens. Just send it to the, the 20 people that are right there by the accident. Just watch what happens. You don't have to get involved. Me, I go over and pick the person up, you know. And, <laughs> but I mean, you know, you don't have to get involved. I was on an overpass once and I saw two cars collide, got out of my car and watched the, the, uh, the two teams come to go in that car and they got in the car in less than 12 seconds. But before they started cutting, two of them went like this and looked all around because they had been moving really fast. And I was up on top of the bridge and I was watching and just sending loving kindness and another friend was with me sending loving kindness. Like, and then the guy just went, like that. It's like somebody said, take a breath. And then they took the jaws of life and cut the guy out of the car and got him out of the car. The best people in the world for you to watch, um, doctors are good, but it can look really hectic in an emergency room. It can look really hectic. Um, but the best place I've ever seen said to somebody, how can I see somebody who actually is living in the present almost moment is a really good EMT team arriving at an accident with a few people that have been hurt. They are so good. If they're a good team, they are right there. They are nowhere else in their mind. They're in the past, the future. It was like this. It could be like that. What do you think? No. It's so like clockwork. And the army field medic, we do not get to witness very much. But the army field medic, the guys in the field, in the service, are unbelievable. I used to know some of them in Taiwan years ago. Amazing stories, amazing. Just so perfect, you know? They said they wanted to be medics because nobody would shoot them. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but it was, uh, but the stories they would tell were so precise, the stuff they had to do when they were platoons were moving and stuff. I don't know of any other occupation I can point to like that. So number one, you had infinite space that you experienced and you touched it. Now with us, what we would say to you is ask you questions about did it get softer? If you're interested in teaching, you want to ask the person, did it get softer? And what did it feel like? And you want, what you're hunting for is you're basically trying to see if they can tell you what soft is. The difference from a coarse feeling to a soft feeling that just is there. You know it's there, but it's not vibrant like the, like the metta was in the beginning. So for the rest of the time, when you leave metta, you don't go back to metta. One of the mistakes I make in my retreats when I coach, I forget to tell people, to stop your ver verbalization the second day. And we're doing it much faster now than we used to. We used to allow the person to continue to verbalize the wish for maybe uh, four or five days, four days anyway, in a, in, a, in a nine day retreat or 10 day retreat for four days. And then I would hear him, now it's like if you say that you had the joy, I'm going to, change you over and have you do the other people. We used to have to get all five pieces in place before we were allowed to tell the person to start working on other people instead of the one spiritual friend. Now, if the person smiles back, put them on the other people. If the person says, I, I experienced infinite space, put them on the other people. If they lost any part of their body, put them on the other people now. Because we can tell something has changed in the energy in the earth, really. And things are moving faster when we put you on this track than they did five years ago. This is why I like to do the season with Bonte if I can co-teach with him, because I get to see the interviews and the rate of, the rate of growth uh, in the interview is so much faster now, and, but it's still secure. What do I mean? I mean that at the end of the retreat, if I talk to the person and they went to a certain point, they can explain everything to me. And what did I tell you about the Buddha's measurement for 
um, for the successful meditation uh, was, um, if it's you know, excellent or poor, was the growth of the person in their meditation, but also in their comprehension. And it's a balance. It's a parallel piece, parallel piece. So an arahat who becomes an arahat and has no understanding to explain the Dhamma at all, well, it's up to them what they're going to do with it, but, but uh, they're very caught. They can't talk to anybody because they didn't keep up with their comprehension. That's why the foundation course is a good thing. And the reason I threw this open tonight was simply because we had so many questions. Everybody can grow from this, and this is bhavana. What we're talking about is development, what's happening. Okay, your next question. Uh, next question, uh, Deepa has many questions, uh, so I'll just ask one question first. Uh, she has given six questions, but uh, the one question, the first question is when one is having a conflict at work or dealing with an argumentative person, how can one use metta? Okay, um, one thing I, that's very interesting, it's always been interesting uh, about this, this particular practice, you know that you can take it to work and you've already seen some really good things in your reports you've told me, okay? Um, but what's wonderful about TWIM is the fact um, that only one person has to know a great deal about some of the key pieces in Buddhism and the other person that you're arguing with or having a bad life experience with or anything else doesn't have to know anything about it. Yeah. And so, and you, and the, my best advice to young people is don't try to teach them. Don't try to teach them. Don't do that. Let you, you, you teach Buddhism by your example, by you living your life. And some of the people that have been to our retreats have done wonderful things as a result of learning this. And um, then people learn from what they're producing in, you know, posters and wonderful things like that. They're doing where they work and how they treat people. But in a situation where there is a conflict at work, of course, you don't, you're not a rug. You don't, you don't put yourself out as a rug to step on. You don't do that. But you are very kind. And the, how does this work? If I understand a couple things, just a couple things, I can, doesn't matter what people do because I see them doing it, but they're not doing it to me. So you let me go away. <laughs> me goes away and you, you look at it differently. You stand with a bubble. If you want to protect yourself, do you want to protect yourself? You put a bubble of meta around yourself and get out of the car and go into the building to work. Now you're inside a bubble of metta, just like if you can't sleep, you put yourself in a bubble of metta and go to sleep and say to your brain, now it's time to sleep, we'll let you sleep. Anything comes in a dream, you're not going to get you because you're in the bubble. <laughs> you're protected and you believe it and you, that you set that up as an affirmation and you just go like this, I'm putting myself in a bubble and I'm going to sleep. I have a sore leg right now. I put myself in a bubble before I go to bed and I usually don't wake up until about four or five. Then I have to take a pain pill. Okay. But you know, but four or five o'clock, I can get a pretty good amount of sleep. In the conflict, the person doesn't know anything about this, but you do. So you've got the upper hand, even though they don't know it. There's no need for them to know there's an upper and lower hand. <laughs> okay. So what you're, what you're doing is you're in the bubble. And so you're perfectly protected. Don't start thinking about what you're going to say while they're saying anything they want to, but they're not saying it at you. They're saying it to themselves because you're not there, you're in the bubble, you see? <laughs> so you're inside the boat and they, they're not saying it to you. They're saying it to a boat. You can very quietly be receptive. You can make eye contact if it's culturally possible, or you can just be smiling to, to yourself. But you don't have to, to, um, to be explaining when they're just talking and talking. This is the key to the thing. What they're saying to you 90% of the time is about themselves and not you if they're angry. Always remember that in the workplace, in the trucking industry, in hospitals, I don't care where you find this, 
when that happens between a supervisor and a nurse or a supervisor and a driver or heavy equipment operators or anything, it always turns out that person who was yelling and screaming, something is going on really wrong in their life. So that puts up an idea of compassion for you as a platform. I can compassionately allow this person to vent. I don't have to take any of it personally because I'm in a meta bubble. I'm not here. They don't know it, but I'm not here. So no matter what they say, it's like water coming here and falling off of you. This is what you imagine. Now, the best thing you can do if you can get to the other end of it, I mean, if it's how you did something wrong, how I have told people how to do this when the, when the, when the person is through, you say, um, can, I make a, can I say something? And they say, yes, I agree with you 100%. That was wrong. <laughs> blow them away okay that was wrong and i think the thing we need to do is if this report is not serving our department maybe we should create it more clearly so that we can understand how to give it to you and make you look good and it, it looks good for the department you understand you turn it around you turn it around but you're not emotionally upset at all because they're not yelling at you they're yelling at a bubble <laughs> and they're really, they're talking to a bubble when they're yelling at themselves. Now, if you know this person and it's like kosher, it's okay, you know, take them, ask them if it's in the morning and they come in early to chew you out before work starts, ask them, I'm going to get some coffee. Do you want me to get you some coffee too? And, and, you know, a donut or whatever, something, do you want something? I'll get it for you. Go get it for them. You know, and then make the suggestion to them. If you can sit down and have tea with them and just say, so, so how's it going somehow? How's it going? Open the door. I swear to you, the dog died or the cat died or the kids scraped their leg or the something happened. Probably this is what's underneath this. And people don't afford to go to a psychologist, psychiatrist, this, that, the other, you know? So what do they do? They go to work and they vent on people, some of them. In Washington, we used to see this a lot, you know, and I, had, I was the uh, human resources firm and that's what I owned and that's all we ever did. We'd deal with these people, you know. So you turn it around. That's the methodology behind it. You have the upper hand, but you, they don't know. They, have, they think they have the upper hand. It's fine. Let them think they have the upper hand. And then find out what they like. They like a rose, send them a rose. They like a, a chocolate donut, send them a chocolate donut. I mean, give them a donut. And just, if you can talk about the issue, if it's a mechanical issue in the office, then what, what you, you can take four questions and play with it. First of all, you can have tea with them and say, what do you think the real problem is for us not to be as efficient as we should be? And the second question is, what do you think is the cause of it? And if they try to pin it on you, do you honestly think it's the cause of one person? It's not usually the cause of one person. If there's some, is there anything besides looking at one person and saying it's the cause of it? Is there some kind of report system or information that's not flowing the right way? What's the real cause of it, okay? The third one is ask them to their face, what do you propose would be the best solution for making this work? Just ask them. And the last part is, that's not, even if you don't agree with it, that's not a bad idea. If you're going to do that for the department, what can I do to support you to make it work? Four questions. What do you think the problem is? What do you think the cause of it is? What do you think the solution is? Don't even contribute to it. Don't take, feel like you have to take turns, you know, suggest things through what the person wants to do. He, she, they, or them, whoever, you know, that's the way to try to approach it without suffering from it, okay? And then at home, send the person secretly. <laughs> send the person loving kindness, but don't do it. If it's a male, be careful, you know? If it's a man and you're a woman, don't send them loving kindness in the office, please. They're going to think, they're going to start feeling it, and it's not what they think it is. And they're going to think you're hitting on them. It's very confusing. But at home, send them loving kindness and peace of mind and, and um, peace of mind and safety. 
and security and happiness. Send them those things. See, that's what we don't believe today. We don't believe this is an energy and we're kidding ourselves. They already measured it at MIT. Those guys are crazy. They already have exactly how many decibels it is and the rest of it in sound. Don't kid yourselves. This is an actual power that you can aim and just send with a smile. And that's what you do with it. Okay, next question. Okay, next question is from Ingrid. It is how to know the difference between sloth and torpor and real body tired when you meditate. That is the real. I'm not sure. I think, Ingrid, I think I wrote a note. I don't know if it was to you or somebody else was asking that question. And it's pretty simple, all right? Um, sloth and torpor is actually a curable malady, okay? So if it's real sloth and torpor, you can try the sloth is the, um, the low energy, falling low energy. And the torpor is the dull, dull, torpor is the tiring. I'm sorry, sloth is the slowing down of the brain and the torpor is the tired body, okay? So you can try more energy, more interest while you're sitting, more interest and more energy, okay? And then, for the actual, uh, tor when you get up to walk, the slope part of your body, you need the energy here. You choose a place to walk that's 20 or 30 feet long. Walk forward and then walk backward to the same place. Don't turn around. It has to be like a hallway or 20 or 30 feet of flat area. There's something that happens. I talked to a neurologist about this is really true. Something happens with our brain getting a lot more energy if we walk forward and walk backward and walk forward and walk backward on this 30 foot thing. Just not slow, pretty normal pace, okay? But do it where you can do it safely, where you're not gonna trip on anything or fall down. Okay, then the other thing is, um, you know, if this, if this, um, uh, that's the way you fix the malady itself, the hindrance, okay? And um, so it's involving uh, curiosity, involving energy and um, interest. But if it is a physical thing and you're just wiped out and you're trying to do this because you're in my retreat, shame, shame, shame on you. <laughs> you need to go to sleep for an hour. Go and lie down and set your alarm for an hour. If it's like in the middle of the day and you're trying to do this or something, just give yourself one hour and then get up. No more than an hour. Wash your face off and try again. That's what you do. When your body is really tired, trust me, oh my gosh, you have to rest. Because the body is one thing, but your eyes are going to go and I have this thing now where I get so tired and then my eyes go and I can't see clearly. I can't work anymore. I'm having trouble with my eyes. And, um, you know, I'm just ha trying to fight this and get do everything I'm trying to do with reading, writing, teaching, you know, and I'm trying to figure out how many hours is that I really need because being shut up this long has been really hard and we don't have a good place to really go exercise it safe, so. Um, but rest and figure out, do I need eight hours for a while? Do I need more time? And then adjust yourself until when you sleep and you get up, you feel rested, okay? That's what you do, okay? Okay, next question. Yeah. Uh, this is from Ardhika. I'll just paraphrase his question. He okay. has uh, uh, given a, a person uh, forgiveness meditation. And mm -hmm. what has happened is that uh, when he is doing the forgiveness meditation, he is f f uh, getting some benefits. But after some time, uh, he is unable to uh, kind of stop his uh, uh, persistent thoughts. He's going to the uh, thoughts of past and he's going to the thoughts of uh, future. And uh, he has asked uh, him to 6R, but this 6R process is not working, he's saying, because his habitual tendency is strong. So uh, he has been doing this for a week now. So he is asking, uh, Hardika is asking you. Yeah, some... okay. As a teacher, um, my favorite, if there's somebody really adamant about doing this and they keep doing it, you know, um, 
first of all, you have to explain to them the reason these thoughts are just popping, popping, popping is because they're trying to stop you from, probably trying to stop you from doing forgiveness. This is the first piece. So he has to have a discussion with his brain. People think I'm kidding, but you have a two-year-old in your head. And the two-year-old sometimes knows a lot of stuff, but the two-year-old, um, it, it learns through persistent repetition is the only way that we can teach it. And um, it, it has, depending on how old you are, like I was 50 when I started this, and I was very frustrated that I could not stop things that I wanted to stop completely. And Bhati really used to chastise me and just said, that's so stupid. And I would say, why is it stupid? You're 50 years old. And I said, yeah, what about it? Said, You've been doing something for 50 years. Let's figure this out. 50 years, your brain has been doing something particular way. And you're deciding that you should be able to stop it in a month or two? Is this, is this some kind of ratio the world needs to know about? You know, this is not possible, okay? So, but there is a way where you can really help yourself to change a habit. It doesn't have to be a 25 year, 25 year thing. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. There's a methodology to changing the way that your brain is operating called, um, and this is the neuroplasticity in your brain, and this plasticity means flexibility of the development of neural pathways. So see, let's do, let's do the board for a minute, okay? Let's do um, this on the board for a second. Um, the way that, um, and it's a wrong pen. <laughs> Here we go. Start writing on the window. That's a good thing. So. Okay. Uh, I like this because you know, the, the, um, the, uh, the lady who wrote the article that got me really interested in this, she had a beautiful picture. And uh, her picture was a picture of a forest. And if you understand how these neural pathways operate, you can change to the, the, your, your uh, behavior pattern. You don't change the neural pathway. You build a new one to take over. So suppose you have a head like this and you have a habitual tendency. You, your head looks like this, by the way, just like that. They're all over these neural pathways that are operating everything in your body, right? Okay. And some of them are really thick. Okay. They're really thick. This is what they say. I think it's an fMRI. They can, the new cameras, they can actually see. So this might be the person's anger pathway or or they have to, they have to pay, they have to think, 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 think all the time. You see? So they allow themselves to think, 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 because why? Because they always have. And this is their habitual tendency is to do this all the time. They need to change this. So first of all, we when we're talking about forgiveness, I always try to get people to understand the brain isn't going to change right away because the brain believes one. It's the brain's job, brain's job, not yours. It, the brain grew up believing that it's not your job to forgive. It's the brain's job to protect you from having to ever think about things that were bad that happened ever again. That's part of what the brain does. Like the way to explain this to you is if you're in a car and the car rolls over in an accident, my neighbor cannot find that two hours. She can, couldn't find it. She lost it. And then she became so distressed. She almost had a really bad breakdown because she felt she needed to know that two hours exactly what happened, even though she survived this accident. You see, it was really tough. And this is part of PTSD, post-traumatic stress syndrome or disorder, post-traumatic stress disorder. Okay is the problem that these folks, their brain is protecting them, but if anything they see, hear, smell, taste, or touch sets off the memory, all of a sudden the brain opens up, the memory was trauma. This is what trauma is about. Now, some people have gone through bad times in their life and they think, 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 and process, 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 and analyze, analyze, analyze. You can't even have a conversation where they don't start analyzing. 
everything before they even get to the next part of it. You know, it's really tough, you know, but that's only because the brain, not just the person personally, but it's also the brain has been doing that since they were little and maybe the mother was an alcoholic and the father was a bum or something and they had a bad time growing up and they were trying to survive and just handling too much and then sometimes kids uh sometimes what happens is that the children become um what's it called um they have to play the part of the parent sibling parents and the sibling the parent isn't functioning so that one child starts being the parent for the other one and then they have a lot of problem in life because they didn't get to have a childhood, they were too busy being a parent. All kinds of things happen. Anyway, the brain's job, we need to get a message to the brain. So what you're doing, you know, while, while you are, you are, um, you are meditating, while you're meditating, these are up in your head and you're teaching yourself the loving kindness and everything. And when you're doing forgiveness, you are saying this, but your brain doesn't want that to come up. You have to have a little talk with your brain. So the first thing is don't forget you need to have a little talk with your brain. And the second thing is you need to keep telling the person the same thing every single time to stop the thinking and they can't do it. Now I'm going to tell you Ajahn Chah's story. Ajahn Chah, he went, um, he was in Thailand at that time and um, a woman from New York, she came to practice with him and she had a terrible problem. She just couldn't stop the thoughts, 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 and she couldn't make any progress. His remedy was really kind of cool. And sometimes when somebody has this very seriously going on, I have done it with a few people. And this one is the blue trash can. And this one over here, this one is, this one is the, um, Oh, we can make it uh, this color. Well, make it. Mm -hmm. This one is the future. This one over here. This one is future. This one is past. So this woman, she would not stop thinking and she would come and talk to him what do i do Bundy? what do i do what do i do what do i do again and again and again and again and again and he said to her okay okay he said he was going to send her home he said he was going to send her home and then he got this idea you're allowed to briefly look at the thought only to say is this from the past put it in the trash can if it's the past you put it in the trash can if it's from the future, you put it in this trash can, okay? And actually that one was supposed to be pink. We have to make that one. There's not a pink one. No pink, okay. Here it is. This is the one, it's pink. And the blue one was from the past. And then the last one is the, um, well, we'll make it, what shall we make it? Let's see, we'll make it, um, I like green, because green, green is important. We'll say this is the one, his was silver. He had a silver one here. And this trash can, this trash can was the only, you put it in here. So she couldn't keep any thought that came up. If it came up and it was from the past, she had to put it in here. Okay, in there. And if it was in a, a thought was about the future worry, she had to put it in here right away. Now, if it was an important thing, she didn't want to forget it. And she really thought about calling somebody to make sure they knew about it, or she needed to remember it. There's something funny about this because it's true. I tested it. The silver trash can. This one is silver. You just don't know it. <laughs> okay. And 
in the silver trash can. This one is important to remember, but don't stop your meditation. What you do is you put it in here, this one. And when you put it in here, he promised her she would remember it later. He promised her, and this is real, it does happen. If you put it in the silver trash can, you will remember it later, unless you're really, really old. <laughs> but, you know, but, but, um, <laughs> cause I have trouble with memory, but, but I've done it with my students and this one is important. This one is the I, the important one. And you keep doing that with the person and say, tell your mind every time you go in, the most important thing for you to do is to do your forgiveness. If they don't start working in a week as a teacher, this is like a no brainer. You don't work with them anymore. Because what they're doing is they're prevaricating. In Sutta number 15 is the what I call the non-torture clause sutta. <laughs> this, because in Sutta number 15, it's 15, I'm sorry, 15, it has 16 reasons why I should teach you and 16 reasons why I should not spend time trying to teach you. And if you have about three or four of those ones that make it impossible, I should stop. And teachers need to remember this and monks are taught this and you never detect it in a monk, they're very quiet. They just don't teach you anymore. But if, you're, if, you're, if it's fixable and they're just overwhelmed with thoughts, if that's what's happening, try the, this thing with the trash cans. You can explain the hindrances, but if they're not going to, if you explain the truth about the hindrances, you sh they should have the book in front of them. They should read it themselves. And you, that's the only way that they will believe you about not ever engaging the hindrance, not ever paying any attention to anything. And because of a Nietzsche, it arises, it will always pass away. And it doesn't have anything important inside it. So let it go. You see? Okay. Next question. Uh, wait, uh, next question I'll ask again uh, from Rahul. Uh, Rahul's second question is, uh, I know that experiences, indulgence, craving are all unsatisfactory. Repetitive experiences make me lethargic in life. How to remain proactive and deal with challenges in life? The experience of tranquility doesn't motivate me to do my duties properly. <laughs> You're going to have to read it again slow, a little bit slower because I'm picking the pieces out. So we started, start again. I know that experiences, indulgence, craving, there are three different things. Experiences, indulgence, craving are all unsatisfactory. Then repetitive experiences make me lethargic in life. Now the question is how to remain proactive and deal with challenges in life. The experience of tranquility doesn't motivate me to do my duties properly. Well, first of all, there's a lot of things that are not understood clearly about, um, there's nothing wrong with experiences, okay? Nothing at all. There's nothing wrong about being happy, about dancing, about liking music. Nothing wrong, okay? There's nothing wrong with being sad about something. If something happens or having an opinion about something that you, ch you have a different opinion about something, nothing wrong with that, especially with a lay person. Nothing wrong with that. What is wrong is craving and clinging about it. Okay. So the solution to what you're talking about is, um, you know, to say we have such, such, uh, extreme what i call slippage right now slippage in understanding we can hear we might hear someone say you should not have any experiences if you are a buddhist you must be a silent person and above all else you should always not smile you should always be like this 
you know, I like it better with my big glasses. You know, with my big glasses, it looked much better. I used to have these giant glasses on, kind of like uh, Mahasi Sayada, you know. And uh, if you ever look at a book, uh, the books he wrote, it, this, you know, he has big dark glasses. You can't see much here with, with me like this, but, but uh, you have big dark black glasses, like, uh, you know, great big ones. And uh, he, they had him on the front of a cover that they probably took a picture of him. I'm not sure if he was visiting hell in his meditation or what, you know, <laughs> but he was, um, or with, and people do that. I mean, I'm not making fun of, you can do that. And maybe he was there, I don't know what was going on, but they took a picture of him sitting and he's sitting like this and he's going. And you want to give this picture to your teenager and you're a Buddhist family for hundreds of years, and you want that teenager to come to that temple on Saturday instead of going to the mall with her friends and buying a pair of shoes. And she does it one time. And one time she goes and sits there. And the monk says, in front of the mother and the 13-year-old daughter, He's going to talk, the mother says, about Buddhism. And the monk says this, Buddhism is about suffering. All of life is suffering. Life is suffering. That is the first noble truth. Second noble truth, the cause of suffering is desire. Third noble truth, the way to the cessation of this suffering is to desire absolutely nothing. The monk is very quiet. The daughter looks at her mother. Mom? Mom says what? Mom, I came with you because I love you. I came this Saturday to the temple. I listened to what he said. Mom, I'm never coming back. <laughs> I had 14 kids in Sri Lanka, 14 and 16 year olds, 14 of them. Last class in Sunday school for American language school. They had to take this course for so many years. Sixth book, last page. So I said to them, as a Westerner, are you going to remain a Buddhist when you finish your schooling and go to college? 14 kids, 12 of them. No, no way, <laughs> no way. Two of them. Uh, one had an argumental point. It was interesting. I won't go there, but it was a fair point. The other ones, I said, why are you going to stay Buddhist? And she looked at me, cutest little girl, and she looked at me and she said very innocently, I must stay a Buddhist because my grandmother told me to, and I will. There you go. What is wrong with this picture? What is wrong with this picture? We have wrong, many, many, many um, mistranslations of meanings floating around that cannot be connected to make sense about the Buddhism today. And we're talking about defining Buddha Dhamma. Try to remember that too. Buddha Dhamma, teaching of the Buddha. Buddhism, Buddhist religion. Buddhist religion, fractionalized all over the place. Buddha Dhamma, one Buddha Dhamma, one main objective, one goal, one purpose, very, very, very clear. Supposedly, these are all talking together in front of the camera for the world, and then they go home with their own points of view with the same problem the Buddha was trying to solve, a lot of times, not everybody, not every person. Don't repeat me the wrong way. But what I'm saying is overall, why were there 12 kids in the last class 
of six or seven years of Sunday school in Sri Lanka who were willing to say that to me. And why did that happen? Okay, because we're moving way far away from what it really was. And it was about basically the smallest one. It doesn't work to live with unwholesome mind states. It isn't good for, well, you, you know, I read you, I read you that description. I didn't read you the next paragraph. And next paragraph, he's very, very clear about it. You know, he says this, uh, we have these two pieces, okay? And the good, the wholesome and the unwholesome. And he says, and so I abided diligent, ardent, and resolute, a thought of sensual desire arose in me, and I understood this thought of sensual desire has arisen in me. This leads to my own affliction, to others' affliction, and to the affliction of both. It obstructs wisdom and causes difficulties, and leads away from Nibbana. That's your key point. It leads away from the main objective. When I considered this leads to my affliction and their affliction, and of others, it, then it subsided in me. So what happened just then? He realized what it was, how it worked. And then it subsided in him, his desire. Because why? Because he found out the truth of what this was about at some point. It's like I tell you guys the story when I was little, the closet in, the, in Bayhead, New Jersey, in my grandmother's old house. My room had a closet. You were not allowed to go in the closet. You had a bureau and a bed for the summertime when you're there. Don't go in the closet. <laughs> for many years, I was terrified to go to sleep in the room because I didn't know what was in the closet. Finally, when I was about 12 or 14 years old, I did a funny thing. <laughs> Everybody was at the beach. I knew they got up after nap and they went to the beach. They knew I had sunburn and they let me sleep. As soon as I left the house, I got up and I did a really weird thing. I looked in the closet <laughs> and all that was in there was history that nobody wanted to talk about. <laughs> Just piles of, hit of clothes and records and stuff like that. All this time, I had no idea who was going to come and get me at night. It was really terrifying. Once I knew who was in that closet, I never, never again. I slept like a baby after that. Never had a problem sleeping in that room because I understood. So the hindrances, you know, you guys are big, strong guys, right? You're big, strong guys. I can see you. And you think that in the hindrance, we have to have a war. <laughs> you know, it's time to fight. You know? And then I, I'm, I'm learning about all of this and, and we're doing fine with our practice because we were taught. But then I get online and some guy from the West Coast, he, he says, um, you know, we have this really neat place. Why don't you come over and read about what we're doing? I said, well, what is it? Well, this is where all the people are in this one room and they are caught in their meditation. Well, what's wrong with them? I said, the hindrances have overtaken them. I said, well, what are they, what, what happens? He says, oh, we talk about the dark night of the soul. It's horrible. <laughs> what dark night of the soul? I missed that chapter. I missed that sitcom. You know, I, I was re listening to the text and he's saying, don't engage the hindrance. He's saying, don't feed the hindrance. He's saying, if you touch the hindrance, it's going to become a big obstruction. And then there's nutriment for it. And it's when I pay attention to it that it gets to eat. So uh, if you keep that in your mind and put it signs all around you and start practicing, open your eyes. If you're stuck, you know, you see one of the signs. <laughs> and don't engage the hindrance, okay? The point is here, it obstructs wisdom, causes difficulty, leads away from Nibbana, but it subsided with him when he knew what it was. So that tells you right there, it early, very early, he realizes if I understand um, the origination, the disappearance, the gratification, the danger, and the escape about any kind of phenomena that comes up. Well, then I can abandon it. And sure enough, that was what I just said to you. That was 148. And sure enough, in 128, in the last paragraph, he's, in this one, 
this is Upak Kalesa Sutta, he's talking to the monks about what not to do with the hindrances. And he tells them in the beginning all the, the terrible stuff he went through. And then at the end, he tells Aniruddha and Kimberly and Nandia, he tells the three monks, listen, all you got to do, all you have to do is identify the imperfection. As soon as you know it's an imperfection of mind, you, you can abandon it. But as, as long as you think it's a big werewolf coming to eat you, you know, or you're, you're, you think it's something terrible and you have to fight it, well, you're stuck with it because you believe it, right? If you believe it, then it's going to be a big problem. So here's the last paragraph there. I understood that doubt is an imperfection of mind and I had abandoned doubt and imperfection of mind. When I understood the inattention was an imperfection, when I saw the sloth and torpor, when I realized I abandoned the, the fear, when, the, when I saw the elation, the inertia, the excess energy, the deficiency of energy, the longing for Nibbana, the diversity, when I abandoned the excess of meditation upon forms, an imperfection of mind. I saw it was an imperfection of mind. So what did I do? Well, I mean, the Buddha told us not to engage it, so we didn't engage it. We let it go. We relaxed and we kept going. So what's the big deal? And these poor men, they are still in California in that room. And what are they doing night after night? They're sharing stories about how to destroy them, annihilate them, eradicate. Some of them have been working on this for six or seven months, caught in the hindrances. They're so afraid they're going to be defeated by the hindrance. How can you be defeated by a hindrance? Feed it your attention and you'll find out. You see, you feed them attention. You feed them every time you pay attention to them. So then after he abandons these, he tells them what happened. This is this really neat paragraph. Listen to this, what happens. Thereupon, after I abandoned all of these, because I, I saw they were imperfections, I abandoned them. So this one word, he abandoned them. That's all. The other suttas say relinquish, release, let go, allow. <laughs> Don't pay attention to all it. This one's just, uh, I abandoned them all. I developed concentration, but he means he developed a productive concentration, not too hard. And um, with applied thought and sustained thought, I developed concentration then with applied, without applied thought and sustained thought. I developed concentration with applied thought and without sustained thought. I, I developed a concentration with joy. I developed a concentration without joy. I developed a concentration accompanied by enjoyment. And I developed a concentration accompanied by equanimity. That's balance. So why does he develop all these? Because he can, he can just develop them because now he's not going to go off here, off there, up there, down there, or anywhere anymore. He's going to take the advice of the Buddha and hear the commander in chief saying, do not engage. <laughs> Hold. Do not engage. You see, so all these guys lined up on the mountain. These guys from California on horses. And they're taking a vacation from the dark night of the soul. We put them on horses and we said, all the hindrances are going to come. And then the Buddha goes, like, do not engage. Why? How many do you think will say, I'm going to go get him. <laughs> well, that's all right. That's all right. That's what you can do. Okay. Did I do that? I don't know. So what, what I wanted you to know, is they said in this question, experience, they talked about indulgences. They talked about um, lethargic, lethargy. Okay. You don't know what tranquility is if you're lethargic when you're in tranquility. Yeah, see, that's the thing. When, when you talk about this way, this is where I get stumped sometimes with the question answer routine because we teach a little differently. So without giving you a glossary lesson first and connecting the dots and then talking about this question, my students would never ever ask me if they were having trouble because they were having trouble with lethargy because they were in tranquility. Instead, they would be sitting there so quiet 
and enjoying the tranquility with absolutely nothing there at all. You see, what you're missing here is one of the modern, this is my version of what the Buddha did. What was he attempting to do? It has to do with discovering the potential of your mind, discovering how powerful uh, this is for creativity and innovation and everything for corporations and development. That's what he gave us, okay? But, uh, but what it really had to, um, to, uh, to, oh, that's one of those senior moments coming. <laughs> I love those. All right. Um, but we are out of time also. I just want to Okay, well, do yeah, you have one more question? I oh, have uh, many questions, but I think uh, maybe we can uh, reply to them uh, separately uh, because it is already okay. 30 now. Uh, how many people are here? How many people are here? Yeah, there was about 30 before for a minute ago. But the thing is, if you pass the word, this is really fun. I like to do it because I like to be able to keep to set, to be able to answer the questions from this one, this one bowl of stuff, you know, and the teaching. And I, I've got it down. That's why Bonte left me here. He left me. He left me here in Asia. <laughs> He said, find a location. Well, yeah, okay. <laughs> it's been three years. I'm still working on it. Um, you know, so um, what I'm, I'm trying to get you to see on this question, let me just finish this up. The experience, you're, you can experience anything you want if you're a Buddhist, okay? The big key to this is independent origination you can just about, you can go be a bungee jumper if you want to. Uh, I, I, I jumped off a mountain for my 70th birthday up in, in the Himalaya, Himalayas. I had to fly sometime if you want. I'll show you that. It was really fun. That was fantastic. I don't think I want to do it again right now, but, but it was really fun. There was snow and everything, but you can do anything you want. The question is, can you live in equanimity? And, and the equanimity is balance. So nothing gets you hyper excited, nothing gets you down, but you live like this. You don't live like this, like a, a straight line. It isn't like that. And the worst thing in the world is to hear someone say Buddhists are pessimistic because this has got to be, this has got to be for the last 20 years of my life, the most interesting and, and uh, absolutely amazing experience. To, to see what happens to you guys. Some time we should, you know, we have, if you like doing the questions and answers, bring your friends and tell them to turn the questions and answers in and we'll answer them. If you understand what uh, joy really is, you would never buy into somebody saying, don't get attached to joy, don't touch joy in a practice. You would never listen to them. If you understood what, in what, uh, um, you know, tranquility really is, it's the, it's the bottom part of joy. When the joy fades away, that's when the tranquility comes in. And tranquility, there's many different kinds of, um, many different kinds of joy. And um, then the tranquility that follows is different from me telling to you, uh, sit still, sit down, be still, be calm. We, I showed you guys a chart one time that I built like has 15 or 16 different words to build up to equanimity. And beyond that is imperturbable mind of the Buddha, a mind that cannot be disturbed. But was the Buddha a sourpuss? No, there's nothing that says Buddhists are supposed to go around with sad sack faces and be sad. And there's nothing that, not, this is one, nothing says when someone dies, you should not grieve. Nothing says that. And that's improper to have somebody tell you that because you can get sick if you put it inside and you do not grieve if someone dies. Don't ever let someone do that to you. You have to pay attention to the natural. It's going back to nature. It's connecting with the way the human being is just like the horse and the deer and the bear and the cougar in the woods. You know, you don't see them ha handing this and that and the other truck. I don't know if we should go down there. There's water. I don't know if we should or not. I don't know. <laughs> the bear going up the mountain. I don't know if we should go in that cave. Maybe we should have a meeting first. No, I don't know. I really want to go in that cave. It's getting cold. No, I don't think so. I think we should get all the bears together and have a, you know, a peace meeting first. <laughs> we don't, bears don't do that. 
I'm not saying we shouldn't solve the problems of the world, but how would it be if you could do that without getting angry? How would it be? Who would be able to hear you? You know, one time I studied something and, and someone brought up, what is the sound of power? And that's the sound of power. <laughs> And when I describe what the Buddha was teaching, I'll leave you with this to chew on. He wanted us to get to, to understand how all phenomena works, like I described, the origination, disappearance, how you get involved with it, the danger of that taking you out of the present time, and the escape that he found. The escape, he says, we can use all the time. He wants you to learn that. But what did he actually teach you to do? He was trying to get you to see what would happen if your brain wasn't doing all this other stuff. What is the power of the human brain if it would just stop doing all this stuff? And it was just this. What would happen with your ideas, with your plans to be an entrepreneur, to do something as a doctor, to do research as a research worker, to be the best writer in the world? It goes on and on and on. If you were never disturbed again by the past and the future. And you could stay in the present time. So when you're sitting to taste it, just to taste it, can you sit and let go of everything and just try, just experience the experience of no experience? That's it. Experience an experience of no experience, no movement at all in the mind. I mean, the lack of understanding of this is amazing. You know, the Buddha was there in the camp with the monks and if he walked down the trail and saw a beautiful, perfect orchid in the forest that was blooming, he might come back and say to, you know, Mogalana, when you go on that path, the orchid bloomed. And then they would go see it too and go past, but they never hold anything in their mind anymore. Except when it's in the present time. What a great dinner you can have with the person if you know it's going to end. <laughs> and it's Aunt Sue and nobody likes her, you know, but you're going to have dinner with her and you can have a great dinner with her. Because you know, Anicca, it's a piece of knowledge. Now put it to use. You see, you know, let's pretend you don't want to go downstairs and help your mom and dad in lockdown because you never had to help anybody before. And there was a maid and now your mom's trying to do everything. There's a lot of that going on. Well, what's it going to hurt for you to help her wash the floors and do some of the things that the maid used to do? It's not going to, not going to hurt you to help the older people in the house now that there's not a maid and a cook and stuff and one person's trying to do everything. And anyway, it's only for 30 minutes to help her or 30 minutes to clean up. Anicca. Everybody needs to say that. Anicca, Anicca, Anicca. Okay. So let's close the prayer, okay? Okay. Is everybody, we can do this again. If you like it, let us know that you had fun with the questions night and you want to do it again. We can do it again. And there's pretty good questions this time. Okay. All right. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we have thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu.